So I work at uh, Google, where I'm on the Daydream team, and I kind of work at the intersection between the Daydream team uh, and the Chrome team, working on web, VR, and AR. And what I wanted to do today, especially for this audience, is give you a snapshot of where we are today, kind of how we've gotten here, uh, and then a preview of where we're thinking of going next. And uh, the reason I was really excited to come to talk to this audience is that you've consistently been early adopters of this technology. Um, and it's really incredibly valuable to me and, and to my team to get your feedback early. Um, so later on, come tell me what you liked and what you don't like and what you need or concerns or just missing pieces and what I'm about to show you, please. It is really super valuable to me and to the team. Um, OK, so quick level set. This is WebVR. This runs in a browser. You click a hyperlink, and it just loads. There's no installation necessary. It just works. It was intentionally created to be sort of a proof of concept, which is why it's such a shameless tilt brush ripoff. I now work down the hallway from the tilt brush team at Google, uh, and I, they took this one in stride, I think. It was, they took it as an homage from the Moz VR team. Uh, what's cool about this is uh, everything lives at a unique URL. So if I want to share something I've made in, in this is called A Painter, by the way. If I want to share something that I made in A Painter, I just send you a URL. And because it's all WebGL, well, WebGL is pretty much ubiquitous these days in modern browsers, so anyone can view it. You don't need to have a VR headset that costs a zillion dollars to experience this. You have reach as a creator. Uh, and because it's open source, uh, anyone can contribute to this. In fact, within uh, 24 hours of A Painter being released, we already had a contribution. Someone had made a rainbow brush and contributed it uh, to the repo uh, via GitHub. Um, and because A Painter is built on another open source framework, like a set of Russian dolls, whoops, I got my slides out of order. Uh, because it's built on another open source framework, which is A Frame, it took the developer, I think, a week to make it. I, uh, he's a very capable developer, but it goes to show the power of open source. Anyone who's used NPM is well aware of this. You do one thing and you pull in this network of things other people have built that you can just utilize for free to get up and running really fast. Uh, and what I love about this example, and the reason I wanted to start with it, is to me it's an example of the intersection that I think a lot about, which is the things we love about the web and the things we love about virtual reality. Um, you know, in a virtual reality present or future, why use the VR web? Like, for one, if you're going to use the web, you've got a desktop computer. It's beautiful. You have a phone in your pocket, which has the web. It's beautiful. If you want to read text, that's a perfect text viewing medium. So why on earth would you put on a clunky headset to look at the web? And then conversely, when you put the headset on, and you're thinking, well, what do I want to do today? You've got all these beautiful native applications made for you. You've got like mind-blowing Vive, Oculus, Gear, Daydream, native apps made in Unity, Unreal Engine. They're beautiful. Web can't compete with that. So we have to figure out, we being people like me and Mozilla and Google who care about the open web, what that sweet spot's going to be. And so A Painter and A Frame symbolize to us one of those sweet spots which is to say drawing on open source and building it, as, building things as a community. Uh, this all got started about three years ago. Uh, I had come off of Firefox OS, which was just a flaming baptism by shit uh, <laughs> of a project. <laughs> um, but I learned a lot. I got religion on why the web was special while I was at Mozilla. And I learned a lot about the web. And then I was kind of coming off that, looking for my next project. And John Carmack had just joined this kid out of uh, at USC um, in, at Oculus. I'm like, well, if John Carmack joins something, it's a big deal. It, it's real. You know? And I could kind of look at the things that were amazing about VR back in the end of 2013, beginning of 2014, and the things that weren't so great about it. Namely, it looked like a lunchbox on your face. And I could kind of figure that, OK, well, the things that aren't good are the things that are going to get fixed because it's computing. It gets faster, cheaper, and smaller. And the thing that's special about it 
the fact that you can put on one of these devices, even in the early days, and feel like you're standing a thousand feet up and get sweaty palms, that's new with a capital N, and that's special, and I want to go work on that. And I wanted to go work on that from Mozilla so badly that I quit Mozilla. <laughs> I was like, okay, guys, peace. You're never going to fund this. I'm just going to go do this. I'm going to go ride couches. I'm just going to go break in this industry. And uh, my CTO stopped me in the hallway the day before I was scheduled to leave and pack up my apartment. I already had packed it up. And he said, well, what do you want to go do? I was like, I want to go do the VR web. I feel there's like a chocolate peanut butter opportunity here, you know? <laughs> and he's like, you idiot, I'll pay you to do that. Just stay here. And moreover, I'll put you with Vlad Vikicevic, who created WebGL in the first place. And the two of you can make a team, an R&D team. And that's, so that's how this got kicked off three years ago. We worked with Brandon Jones over at Google, who was doing it as a 20% project. And we began to put out these prototype builds that enabled you to plug in an Oculus DK1 at the time and then type some WebGL and get a VR experience. And back then, I was like proof of concept day. I was like, is the web fast enough to even you know, do a VR world? Because God knows VR is really demanding in terms of performance. Uh, and we went from these early proof of concepts to sort of progressively more complex examples to where we stand today. And I'm going to show you a quick, monta quick montage of some of what people, I, I really, I think some of what people like yourselves in this room are currently doing uh, with WebVR. A lot of these were taken from a recent um, WebVR experiments uh, collection that was launched by the Creative Lab team out of New York. And they contracted a series of teams uh, around the world at agencies uh, like Jam3 and Be Real uh, to create the experiences you're about to see. It's quick, but it'll give you a flavor for what people like yourselves are doing right now. Uh, all of these, most of these experiences uh, are responsive, so they adapt to the platform you're running on, whether it's Vive uh, or Daydream, for example. Oh, that one's hard to see. That one's amazing. That's cruciform by uh, uh, Jaume Sanchez Elias uh, out of Barcelona, former Be Real TL. And the cool thing about all this is it's JavaScript. Uh, so if you know JavaScript, you can write a bit of 3JS or use A-Frame. You write it, and then your experience works on desktop or it works on uh, mobile. And it's low friction. You don't have to install anything to be able to look at Marpy's mass migrations piece, which is really it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. Uh, so it embodies the best of the web. You know, you know JavaScript, write JavaScript. You know, you launch it at a URL, click on a link, you get it. Works across desktop and mobile, so you don't have VR. That's cool. You can reach everybody. And if you do have VR, whatever device you have, it works on, in theory. And I'll get to uh, the gap between that nice sales pitch and the reality in a second. Uh, if you're interested in vetting what I just claimed, um, those are two really good sites to do so at. It's uh, webvr.info and webvr.rocks. Um, uh, and they're done as a collaboration between uh, the Moz VR team, uh, my former colleagues there, and then the Google people and the Oculus people. All the different browser vendors work together to make sure that these sites are up to date. So if you want to know the current status on this technology and how you can play with it and where the pitfalls are, those are two very good sites. So that's kind of a quick snapshot of where we are today with WebVR. Um, the only problem, well, not the only problem, one of the big problems to adoption is you find an experience, whether you're on an experimental build of Chromium on desktop with your Vive plugged in, uh, or you are using Chrome for Android in your hand and your phone, you hit an enter VR link, it goes into stereo, you drop it in your data, and you're looking at WebVR experience, that works. But the crappy thing is, if you want to go somewhere else, you got to take it out, you know, put it back in your hand, or go back to your keyboard, change the URL, and then go to a different site. So that's not the web. I mean, the web has always been low friction, seamless surfing from site to site to site to site. Until recently, that wasn't possible. Uh, but one of the things we're working on, I can give you a preview of, we showed this at I.O., but we haven't shown it anywhere else since, uh, is something that I went to Google to build and to work on, uh, which is Chrome for VR, which joins a couple uh, existing browsers in the market to try to create VR browsers. So you put on a headset, and you surf the web. So it works like this. Uh, you are looking at hiking trails in British Columbia on your mobile phone. You drop it into your phone. I forgot to add that slide. And you can surf the web in 2D using a Daydream controller. Go from site to site to site. And when you find a WebVR experience, click a button, and you're just in it. User hits uh, one of the buttons on the controller to exit. Uh, we have video support modes. You have like full screen video playback and sort of a home theater mode. 
And then one of the neat things is because it's Chrome for Android, uh, all of your history, all of your bookmarks, everything comes with you because God knows it's a pain in the ass to enter in text in VR. We don't want to make you do that. So when you drop from Chrome for Android into uh, Chrome VR, you get all your passwords. So for example, if I'm logged into that hiking site, uh, I remain logged in. If I hit my tabs, all my tabs are there. So what we're working to do is to make a, the way I, what I liken it to, oh, hello. What I liken it to is a mobile safari um, for iOS 1, if you remember when that came out. Uh, it was backwards compatibility. Remember like the pinch to zoom, what a, how mind-blowing that was the first time you saw it? It had backwards compatibility. It took a web design for a completely different form factor, and then it brought it into mobile with some affordances for that kind of adapting that UI with pinch and zoom and later things like reader mode. And then it also had hooks for creating mobile first web experiences through things like media queries uh, and new, uh, new styles. So we want to do the same thing. This is like our mobile Safari 1.0. It's backwards compatibility, plus through WebVR, it's hooks for future capabilities as well. It's all like super work in progress. Everything you're seeing is uh, uh, subject to change over the next, uh, uh, towards the end of the year when we begin to release this. Um, there is bits of this landing right now in Chrome for Android Canary, uh, which is our nightly channel. You can actually go into Chrome uh, flags and flip a couple flags that just say like Chrome VR uh, to enabled to be able to play with this. Uh, we'll have a version out, call it like mid-September, which will be a super early sort of a 0.1 basic building blocks piece of it. it. lets you surf in 2D and go into VR mode and do some of the cinema mode stuff I showed you, full screen video mode. Uh, and then the real release will come later in the year and allow for things like accessing your most visited, uh, accessing your bookmarks, uh, searching whether through uh, text or through voice, uh, and all the things you'd expect from a browser. It's kind of table stakes. Like I have metaverse visions dancing in my head, but sort of to get from here to there, we want to do the next logical thing, which is let you put on a headset and, and browse, and let your users put on a headset and browse. Uh, I hope too that as we do this, we can add touches of whimsy like you know the dino game you get in chrome like what if it was on a carousel around you and you could bounce the controller like bounce the, the little dinosaur person uh over the obstacles that'd be pretty slick this is totally fake this is made in c4d uh <laughs> if only i knew some talented design agencies uh who could help us make some web vr interstitials inside the chrome to keep it fun <laughs> That's the weirdest RFP ever. <laughs> uh, what we're also going to do is, I mean, the web is no longer synonymous with browsers, which is awesome. The web has speciated. Um, so what we want to do is also enable a native developer or a web developer to get their experience into the hands of users without having to make those users go through the browser. So for one example, um, let's say I'm on Daydream Home. This is our home experience. Uh, and I, yeah, uh, I find an experience I like. This could be a WebVR experience. I click on it, opens in Chrome immediately, and I'm in that I'm in that application. So what we're going to try and do is to create larger acquisition funnels for users into uh, WebVR experiences, and then also a little bit more longer term, enable native application developers. Like let's say you're making an application in Unity, just use the web as a building block. We take this for granted on mobile today. On mobile today. The web is everywhere, but you, the browser isn't necessary. It's kind of hidden behind the scenes. But you can use Node to build your application, or you can use an embedded web view inside of your native application to bring in bits of the web. I want to get to the same place in virtual reality as well. So we're going to be working really hard on that also. Uh, now let's see if I can attempt the context switch here to a totally different deck. All right, so how much time do I have? Does it say back there? Someone flash like hands at me. Infinite. Okay, that's cool. Um, how am I doing? No, no. Okay. Uh, this is what you, happens when you don't practice. Right. So everything I've showed you is uh, WebGL, which is awesome for you people. Because <laughs> you are really capable. A lot of you are designer developers. You can write WebGL. That's fantastic. There's just a problem. There's a couple problems with it, though. Again, I love, love, love WebGL, uh, but it has these shortcomings. Well, one, 
Uh, a lot of web developers don't know how to write it. This is the source code for a Rainbow Membrane by Kabibo, which is one of my favorite WebVR experiences. It's a lot of WebGL. WebGL is JavaScript. And even if you use 3JS or A-Frame, it's still a pretty hard bar high barrier to entry if you come from an HTML and CSS background. And more subtly, can you imagine a web in the 1990s where every single web developer had to make their own scroll bar? Would that have been good for usability and for consistency? I would argue no. Like I learned in Mr. Stokowski's social studies class how to use one website, and I know how to use 99% of the websites out there. I think that was a good thing for the web's growth. And if everything's going to be WebGL, which is to say everything's made from scratch, from the interaction model to the visuals you see, you're going to have a low volume of content and a really inconsistent level of quality of content. And I think that could impede the web's growth. So uh, what I want to do what I want to do is enable developers to create WebVR experiences without having to know WebGL. And we think we can get a lot of mileage with just a little bit of work. So for example, uh, I am looking at this 2D website. Uh, or I make a 2D website. My user's looking at it. I've got this huge 360 background. I should be able to fill it with something. So imagine that instead of having it limited to the stupid plane, I can use CSS properties. I can make the window transparent. And then I can use C3D transforms to position my DOM elements in true three-dimensional space, not flattened to the surface of that window, but actually positioned uh, around the user. Again, no WebGL, totally declarative, just more responsive web design. You've got your desktop site, your mobile site, and your VR site. You don't have to rewrite anything. It's just some more styles. Uh, I am super excited about this. Uh, I've been doing experiments in A-Frame and using the CSS render in 3JS. Uh, which is everything you're seeing is built on one of those two things, to play with this. We also built a CSS browser at Mozilla, uh, which enabled us to build worlds out of DOM elements, not WebGL, which sounds asinine, but actually it was a lot of fun to use Chrome DevTools to just bang out a website using these planes in space was actually super compelling. And I think for a certain class of VR web content, it could be perfect. Like, I don't need to have a crazy rich experience if I'm just doing a car browser or if I'm Airbnb doing a real estate browser. And the cool thing is, there's also some really interesting side benefits if we do this. Um, for example, uh, we're all worried about personal space in VR for very good reasons. but. If we're looking at a WebGL site, the browser doesn't know anything about what it's interpreting. It doesn't have a semantic level of understanding, and it doesn't have a per-object level of understanding of the world you're looking at. However, if we build these worlds on top of CSS and the DOM, uh, the browser does. And so you might be able to install an extension that gives you like a personal safety barrier, and you can push objects backwards out of your personal space until you grant the permission that says, you know what, I trust this website. It can actually get close to me. That's pretty cool. Uh, you can reach out and grab an individual object. We all take for granted on desktop. You can just drag an image from your browser to your desktop and blop, you save it. Same thing could apply in VR. Looking at a 3D model of a chair and you grab it, you look at it, everything else fades away, and you kind of put that aside for later. Again, totally impossible to do if we're going to do it on top of WebGL, but if we do it with declarative uh, markup, it all becomes possible. I love this one. This is Minecraft. This is Minecraft. The only difference is a shader pack. Imagine if CSS gained physically based uh, shaders as like valid materials, the web would just get more beautiful over time. And you would see browsers begin to compete based on who does glass the best. A user doesn't have to do anything. They said it was glass in 2018, and it's still glass in 2028, and it just looks way better because the render engines have interpreted how to do glass better over time. That's pretty interesting to me. Uh, there's a lot to be worked out here. Like we have to kind of work out the rules by which sites can expand or collapse. We want to be able to, let's say, crop a website until we allow it to actually uh, expand uh, outwards via something like the full screen API. Lots to be figured out. Uh, but again, I'm really, 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 really bullish on this. And again, as I mentioned, uh, in part because we built this. This was built on one plane flight. It was a UI, a VR UI built in HTML and CSS. Um, I went to uh, the Internet Archive. I grabbed a DOS box port of Neuromancer for the DOS running in WebAssembly and put it up on an iframe and put that iframe uh, like 15 feet wide and like 30 feet away from me. I did that like in five minutes, not shitting you. And uh, uh, it was awesome. Like that's the power of being able to take the web we love and just use it as a massive source of building blocks using the skills we already have. I'm, yeah, I think this is going to be awesome. Uh, so how do we get there? Because as we all know, the web standards take a really long time to actually bake. So 
we're going to do it extensible web style. Um, so what I mean by that is uh, I want to get to the point where we've got these, like a model tag and uh, and uh, you know, 360 backgrounds uh, and these magic windows for free. But the extensible web path uh, basically says, don't spend five years to build something maybe no one wants, because I could be totally wrong about these hypotheses. Give developers, such as yourself, low-level enabling standards, and then watch what you do with it. Watch the different frameworks battle it out, then say, all right, that's a clear winner. Let's bring that up into a standard. It's much more of an evolutionary process. We want to do the same thing. So, for example, uh, one of these things will be a WebVR 2.0 API with uh, magic window support, which will enable you to do things like this. You've got a 360 WebVR experience. It has an origin. That origin gets wrapped inside a magic window. And then users on uh, six DOF, you know, full degree of freedom headsets can just kind of lean and actually peek inside your experience. Or if they're on a mobile phone, they get the same thing for free. It's easier for you as a developer to do this, and you can begin to do things that were previously effectively impossible, like what I'm showing here. You also don't have to just use as a magic window into a world. You could put an object at that origin point and do some pretty cool stuff like this, where you can actually have like a model viewer. So the user can lean side to side to look at it. And if they look at it from the end, from the sides, it's fake. Like it gets cropped by the edge. It's kind of a weird effect. Uh, but we think it's pretty exciting. I think yeah, I'll come back to why I think it's exciting in a second. And what I'm trying to do right now is like work out all the rules for this stuff. Uh, everything you're seeing, by the way, is built in uh, After Effects and Cinema 40. It's all totally faked. But I think we need to be able to specify an origin, put an object the origin, specify kind of a frame. And then, as a developer, know that the, whatever's inside that frame will be like fit into that magic window. So if you're doing a model viewer, you're going to want to have that level of control. Like, no matter how big or small the window my object is put into in the 2D layout, make sure it always frames this particular thing. This is what we're trying to work through right now. Uh, and the we here is uh, it's a lot. It's Brandon Jones and myself at Google. Uh, but every week we're on a call with our friends at Mozilla, and Oculus, and Samsung, uh, and Microsoft talking about what this, what this API needs to be, because it's the web. And so all these different vendors are working together really closely, which I have to say is pretty cool. I mean, we hear a lot about how fragmented VR is, but I will say on the web, uh, there's a ton of camaraderie, uh, which is, you know, it's, it is the web, and so it only succeeds if it's ubiquitous and it runs everywhere. Um, there's one more thing, actually, I want to touch on. Uh, uh, has anyone here ever tried to or wanted to put HTML and CSS into WebGL? I know there's like a couple of people who will know that pain point really well. That was impossible because of security, but we're working to actually bring down that barrier. So you could have an iframe with a bunch of DOM elements. Uh, the iframe has, can't do cross origin, it has to be same origin. There'll be some other restrictions, but basically you've got a bunch of DOM elements and you can now bring them into WebGL. They run uh, at full animation for free. Uh, you can target them and get click events, scroll events propagating through. Basically, if you're making a WebGL experience, you'll be able to actually bring the HTML and CSS into a WebGL. This is super early. We're still working through all the security implications, but there's a tentative consensus among browser vendors that this is worth, do worth doing. And the reason I bring it up here is it will enable us to experiment in an extensible web way with all those cool declarative standards I mentioned. We'll experiment with those ideas and those workflows in WebGL, and then we'll prove them out, and then we'll actually bring them out into standards. And I want to emphasize like how fucking weird how weird the possibilities are going to be. If you have magic window, which I showed you, and you can put the DOM into a magic window, bizarre shit becomes possible. Like you're scrolling a 2D website, and at some point, maybe halfway down the page, it's the DOM here and it's the DOM here, but the DOM here is actually in you know, a magic window in WebGL, and so it begins to sort of flutter and blow away like leaves at full WebGL performance while still being interactive. Like there will be some. I, my next thing when I get some time is to make a whole bunch of like really rough examples of what this could be. Uh, I just knowing how mischievous and inventive the people in this room are, I really look forward to seeing what kind of crazy things you do with it. Uh, and so I'll wrap up with a kind of a fourth beat here, which is everything I've showed you so far has been virtual reality, which I think I'm really bullish on. But virtual reality is kind of uh, an away game for the web, and what I mean by that is. The reason you tolerate how stupid you look with a headset on uh, is because of awe and wonder. That's a big part of it, because you do have presence. That is sort of the, I mentioned before, that's new with a capital N. That was never possible before. Uh, and a lot of what inspires awe and wonder in virtual reality is rich graphics. You know, um, It's someone 
like Eddie Lee's team making Cosmic Trip, we spent an unbelievable amount of time to make a beautiful experience. And it's just all about craftsmanship. And it's about subtleties of interaction. And it's about beauty. Uh, and to recoup the cost of doing that, they're going to charge like 60 bucks a title. And well, they should. And so they want to be able to distribute it and get paid the 60 bucks through a channel that allows for payments and it has enough critical mass of people buying things, yada, yada, yada. None of what I'm describing is the web's traditional strength. That is not the web's traditional model at all. Uh, I think we can do it. And I'm super bullish on the web getting to that place kind of bit by bit by bit. And I think we're already seeing evidence that it will get there. But it's an away game for the web. What is a home game is augmented reality. Uh, augmented reality doesn't need to fill the entire world in order to be compelling. Like you could be walking by a bus station in some future, you know, five months to 50 years, depending on who you talk to with a pair of glasses on. And you just want to see the bus station times. You don't need like a whole crazy simulation. Just give me the information, please. And oh, by the way, my friend doesn't have a crazy headset, she has an Android phone, so she needs the same information. It's municipal data, just give me the data, make it responsive. And when I walk by the bus station and get it, I don't want to install an application, just give it to me just in time. And you know what? Don't let that bus station try and poke something out into the middle of the fucking freeway while I'm driving, because it could blame me and it could hurt me, you know? So I need to have control as the user agent, as the user, over what gets put into my world. This all sounds like the web. Uh, it sounds like a really good fit for the web. It doesn't even sound particularly difficult, to be honest, relative to what we're talking about in VR, as long as the hardware is there. So what we just announced at Google I.O. is a build of Chromium, which is the open source engine, the open source browser that Chrome is built on top of, uh, with support for Google Tango, which is our depth sensing camera technology stack. And uh, this is a demo that we built recently with uh, Wayfair that uh, for this Chromium device, you're seeing a screen capture of a user uh, with a Tango-enabled device. This is all built in WebGL, all built in JavaScript, no installation, uh, using depth sensing cameras to select uh, items from an inventory. Wayfair has all their assets in 3D, which is fantastic. Drop it into place, and then use their finger to rotate it to kind of pick a different angle, to look at different models. Again, all being tracked uh, perfectly at near-native performance uh, on the web stack. Uh, this is available, uh, oh, this is another example, this is with occlusion, so we can do things like, this is a GIF, uh, it runs better than this, obviously. Uh, we can do things like uh, occlusion with a table, will occlude objects. All this stuff is still really early as an industry, but the fact that we can already do this on the web is really, really exciting to us. So if you have a Tangle-enabled device, uh, you can get, then I'll tell you which devices those include. Uh, you can just go to this GitHub link, Google VR, uh, at github.com, and uh, grab this. And there's a ton of documentation on how to get started with this. Uh, and there's the devices, Lenovo Fab 2 Pro or Zenfone. Uh, you don't have to use Chromium Tango either because Tango is not a widely diffused hardware platform yet. Uh, there is also AR.js, which I want to give a shout out to, which is really awesome. It's by Jerome Etienne. Uh, it's picking up a lot of steam right now because Jerome is just cranking out examples at a crazy pace. Uh, it just uses camera, standard RGB camera technology. It doesn't require a depth sensing camera like Tango. Uh, it uses WebRTC plus WebGL. So if you have an Android phone, you can begin to go get ARJS and just get started playing with this. And Jerome has created a ton of examples, a ton of tutorials. Uh, he and his wife are a two-person machine, just creating example after example after example. Um, uh, if you just Google AR.js, you'll find this. Uh, it's really impressive stuff. Uh, and as he says, 60 FPS even on two-year-old phones. The reason I say you need Android is because this relies on WebRTC, which Apple is not as yet supporting. We hope that they will. Uh, once they do, this will work on iOS as well. So, early days, but uh, very exciting. So I want to wrap up. Oh, yeah, I think I hit it. Uh, the future is going to be fucking strange. Like that is like that's trippy shit. The possibility is really odd, and that's nothing. Like. WebAssembly, if you haven't heard of it, is crazy as shit. It's native code in the web at near native performance. Decentralization, if you've heard of IPFS, don't host your site with some third party hosting service. Host it like the way you would a BitTorrent file amongst everybody decentralized. Uh, blockchain, machine learning, robotics, next generation graphics APIs. Like, there is an astronomical amount of change coming at us. And what I see is a whole bunch of crazy new, very advanced ingredients. That makes me excited because the browser, as it's currently constituted, is a pretty old recipe. Uh, and I'm really excited by the idea of new recipes. Uh, 
when I look at these technologies that are emerging, when I look at the stuff we already have, again, I blur my eyes and I can begin to see the sort of contours of what we've been imagining in science fiction for a very long time, and we get to make it. And the we, I really specifically mean to include the people in this room, because you are our early adopters. The early adopters of the original web were academics, now it's you. So uh, people like yourself in this room have, done, have gotten us where we are today, uh, and I hope we can continue to work together to define what the future could be. Then we standardize it, and we take it from millions to billions, and we build the future. So thank you very much.